church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus, who has resurrected me. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the 
last time was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from the tears and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who had come to the father are restored and the church of christ was Welcome to Prairie Creek Church. Good to see y'all. Um, yeah, so uh, what about this weather? It's pretty good, right? Oh, man, I like the hot. So uh, we were out in the baseball yesterday for like the whole day playing playing ball with the kids and stuff. And so it got, got really hot, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We had a bunch of like those awning tents all around us where we would just try and get in shade because there was like zero shade there. So. But, well, hey, how about we open with prayer, um, and then we will stand up and uh, just worship God through music. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for today. Um, God, I pray that today um, you would get all the glory from the service, Lord. That I pray that we can <coughs> just be able to um, leave our stuff and be able to come together today and worship you for all the blessings that you have given us, God. We are so blessed um, to be able to have one uh, just um, big family here um, and uh, the networking that I've seen uh, through the Notes family uh, and just being able to um, share our faith with people who might not see that. And so, um, God, uh, I just have seen you work so much these last uh, this last month and just being able, to, uh, I just want today to be able to just worship you and praise you for all that you deserve, God. Um, you are so amazing. So Jesus, we love you so much and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Uh, let's stand up and sing mighty to save. compassion a love that's never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nations savior mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again i give my life to follow everything i believe in now i surrender i surrender mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king jesus Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to 
to say forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king jesus shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king you are here moving in our midst i worship you are here working in this place i worship you i worship you you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker Miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every lives around I worship you I worship you you are here mending every heart I worship you I worship you you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 stop he never stopped working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop he never stop working you never stop he never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working he never stop he never stop working he never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you working even when i don't feel it you working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is are way maker, miracle 
I am so glad that we can proclaim that, right? That even when we can't see him, even when we can't feel him, you know that he's working. And so, and that we can proclaim that that is who he is, that he is our promise keeper. He is our miracle worker and our way maker. And so I just want to, you guys can all have a seat. Um, I wanted to share something. I kind of texted Nicole and um, Matt this morning. Um, and just to like get an update on how everything's going, what's going on, all that good stuff that I can share with all of everyone. And, um, and so, and then just some things that we can pray about and we'll, we'll go in prayer here in just a minute. So this is what I got from Nicole. Um, he is waking up with lots of exclamation marks. That is a good thing. Um, we can see him looking at us. Uh, we are taking, or we're talking right now about drawing back on another seizure medicine and um, talking through what to use so he doesn't experience withdrawals from the sed sedation medicine. Um, we are no longer on insulin, coma med, and coming off another sedative medicine, praise God. Um, we are on some concentrated food in the feeding tube. We will wait to talk to neurology soon to confirm no seizures for like 76 hours, which if you would have known what happened four days ago, I sounded like he had hundreds through the night. And so um, <laughs> God's healing. So, um, <laughs> yeah, right. It's so good. Praise God. Um, so, yeah, pretty sure he nudged me this morning, um, nudged my hand off his arm and my and his leg. Um so he's back to feeling annoyed by me being on top of him. So that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God for them this morning. And we love you guys so much. Um, things to pray about is uh, just maybe pray no more seizures. And as we take away these um, anti-seizure meds. So, geez, it's so good, right? It's so good. <sighs> yeah. Um, so that song, like, even when we don't see him, even when we don't feel him, like, man, he's working, you know, like they were, they were at the point, like, it's just, they, they couldn't see something like just a good thing happening. It just seemed like bad and bad and bad. And you know what? God shows up and he is going to show up. And I just have faith that, um, God is going to make things anew. And so, um, and yeah, so let's, let's just go in prayer. And, you know, I've heard, um, through the grapevine that Brie is doing, very well also, um, which is amazing. And so it sounds like um, she, her kidney function is back to almost normal and she's eating. And so, yeah. And then um, apparently I heard that there's two other kids that have kind of come down with the same E. coli. So, um, and let's lift them in prayer too. I don't know their names, unfortunately, but um just that the fact that our family is going through this and we know what it looks like. And so um, just praying for that family and hopefully we can be there for them um, also. And so, yeah, let's just uh, let's let's just go to the Lord in prayer here. So, um, Lord, uh, we just want to thank you so much for the work that you are doing. Um, God, sometimes we don't understand. Uh, why things happen. Um, sometimes we have to question you. Um, but God, ultimately, we have to trust you. And so, um, and we have to have faith in you. And God, you, your timing is perfect. And so, Lord, I, I pray for the entire Notes family while they are um, reeling from this they see signs of your hand in there and they see signs of your healing hand. And so, God, I pray that you would continue to do your work, God, that you continue to do um, your healing process. And so, Lord, um, through the doctors and the nurses and the medications and Lord, I pray that you would continue to heal um, Cal and just um, uh, bring them back to us. We miss them like crazy. <laughs> And so, Lord, I just um, want to pray for Briella and their family. Um, as it sounds like you have um, 
you have made a way for them. And so, God, they see the light at the end of the tunnel and they're they're looking at it. And so, God, I, I just praise you for that. And God, these two other little kids um, that have contracted this. Um, Lord, I pray uh, that you would just intervene um, soon and now that you would just um, be there uh, for them and um, comfort them and put you put them in your healing arms. Uh, Lord, we pray that um, this community, this church can be there for them in prayer um, constantly. Um, I know that's what we've been doing with Briella and Cal. And so, God, I just I, I lift them into your hands. Um, Lord, heal them and let this go away. Um, and uh, God, I pray for Nicole and Matt and um, Eric and Tara and Barb and um, everyone else who is just um, in that family, really connected. God, I pray their immediate family. I pray that you would show yourself to them um, in a mighty way that, Lord, that your that faith in you will equal complete blessing in the way that like we can um, just uh, trust the process and God the and just be able to heal Cal and you take you get the glory from that God that the healing comes to you um, Lord it's awesome how you've been just showing up in minor ways for them um, with the doctors and the nurses um, saying you know, Matt's got a song playing, uh, Casting Crown song playing, and a nurse or a doctor walks in and says, I love Jesus too. This is awesome. And so, God, I just, I pray that you would just um, continue those little um, nuggets of your um, everlasting faith to them. And so, Lord, we love you so much, and we just praise the work that you're doing there. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to grab that for them, okay? So um, you're maybe seeing a theme here. Some of the songs that we have sung this morning uh, about Jesus being mighty to save and that our responsibility is to shine the light of the goodness and glory of Jesus in the world so that others can come to know and love and serve him too and that he's mighty to save them. And then we sing Waymaker, that he's the light in the darkness. Um, and the, the message today is talking about the, the urgency of the need to be on mission for Jesus today. And we have some friends of ours from Utah, Ben and Amanda. So I'm going to invite you guys to come on up at this time. Ben and Amanda are, are missionaries in Utah, church planners. Um, and they're on mission for Jesus in Utah. And God's at work in their story and in their lives. And so I just, uh, they're visiting uh, um, uh, Chris and Amanda. And you can come on up here, man. You're vi they're visiting Chris and Amanda. And... Um, they're going to, he's just going to be sharing with us what, how God's at work in Utah and how God has, is, has work in, in their calling and their obedience to, to the call of Jesus to be on mission for him there. And then later tonight or later this evening, uh, back here, right? Right back here at four o'clock, we're going to, we're going to, for those of you that want to hear more, that you're going to just get your appetite whetted this morning. But for those who want to hear more about how God is at work in Utah and just want to hear about the ministry that God has called Ben and Amanda too. Uh, want to invite you back to come hang out with us this afternoon and hear more, be able to ask questions, interact with them and get to know them a little bit more and, 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 and pray for them, okay? So uh, right now I'm just going to ha hand this off. And, and by the way, it, here's an interesting thing. Um, you guys were supposed to come like some weeks back, right? And it didn't work out. And, um, and now God's timing is amazing because uh, we're in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus called and sends out, commissions his disciples to be on mission for him. And so starting this week and in the several weeks to come, we're talking about what it looks like to be on mission for, as disciples of Jesus. So the timing on this, I mean, we couldn't have orchestrated. That's the spirit of God. So God's, God's doing some cool stuff. And so I pray that you'll be listening and responding to the spirit as, as we hear what, what God is doing, not just here in Maquoketa, but around the world. So Ben, thanks so, thanks so much for your obedience. And um, yeah, just share your heart with us what God's doing, all right? Thank you, Pastor. That's a bright light up here. Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, so obviously my name's Ben. That's my wife, Amanda, and we have five kiddos. So um, for those who don't know us, and um, probably 
many of you have seen us before, some, somewhere in the past, uh, in the past couple of years. But um, we're grateful to be here and this opportunity to just to share what the Lord's been doing in our heart and our life. And um, so, yeah, years ago, uh, my wife and I, we were married. We were serving in our local church in Georgia and just really felt called by the Lord to pursue full-time ministry, full-time mission. And we actually went to uh, school up in North Carolina pursuing a Master's of Divinity uh, at a seminary up there. Uh, and during that time, we just felt like the Lord, this is a really short story, we really felt like the Lord was leading us to, to Utah. And uh, I didn't know much about Utah. I knew there was a lake. And uh, there's some people out there uh, that were, who's those people? Mormon people. All right, you, you know it just as much as I did when I moved out there. So there we were, and um, initially, right, that's, that's kind of what I grew up knowing. In fact, when I grew up, I didn't know any Mormons. I don't know if, if uh, the LDS faith, that's, that's how they uh, can refer to themselves as well, Latter-day Saints. If that's big out here in Iowa, I'm not really sure. But, uh, or if y'all know any folks like that uh, out here in Maquoketa. But that's what we, we were going to engage and I just want to read a couple of verses as we try to, it's our desire to exalt Jesus. It's our desire, whether we're in Maquoketa or whether we're in Utah or in Georgia, we want to exalt the name of Jesus and we want to bring glory and honor to him. And so here's a passage uh, from Colossians, just want to read. In Colossians 1, 13, a couple of verses after that as well. He says, he, this is Jesus, has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and he has transferred us to the, actually this is the Father, has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is a, a huge theological understanding for Christians. Then in verse 15 it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is the most special. Jesus is preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so we want to exalt Jesus and his work and his saving work. But what, what if I told you there was a, a dominant faith, let's just say Makokita. What if out of every person you saw in this room, there was only one person in this room that believed that. What if everybody else in this room believed that Jesus was your brother? That he was there to show you the way for you to become your own God. You can actually exalt yourself to becoming God. Because God was just like you one day on a different planet, in a different world, in a different universe, and he exalted himself to becoming God. And you are working super hard to do all the right rules and follow all the right steps so that you too can become like God in every way. And what if there was only one person in here that believed this? Because that's the reality in Utah. Out of every hundred people in Utah, there might be one or two that believe the Bible. One or two that would say, I'm born again. The vast majority of Utah is committed to the LDS faith. Somewhere around 67% of Utah claims to be a member of the LDS church. And they're on their road to becoming God. Well, supposedly. And so, guess what happens to Jesus' name when you are working to become God? Jesus' name is not exalted. Jesus' work is not exalted. 
Jesus is there to be your brother to help you on your way to achieving your goal. But here's what we believe. The Father has delivered us from the domain of darkness. If you are familiar with Ephesians 2, we know that we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. Apart from Jesus, we are, we are just on the, the operating table. We got nothing. We don't cause our own self to just come alive again. And he has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We've been transferred from darkness to light. And he has forgiven us our sins and redeemed us. And he's bought us with his own blood. And here's the stark reality in Utah. People don't know that. I shared in a place in Utah the gospel with 10 people in a city where there's less than 1% of born-again believers. And all 10 of them said they've never heard the gospel before. What country do we live in? We li well, theoretically, you know, we live in a, a, a country where people have heard the gospel before. Well, I know several places, Utah is one of them, where the gospel is not being proclaimed. And if you wanted to find a dark part in our country, you can come to Utah. Where everyone's pursuing becoming a god. That, that's if they legitimately are following their faith. That's the, the stark reality of where we live at. And why, did, why do we go there? Well, Utah is considered one of the least reached, if not the least reached state in the United States as far as born-again believers. Uh, Percentage-wise, there's obviously way more un people that don't follow Jesus in California or New York, but percentage-wise, Utah is at the top of the list for America, least reached. And so we feel like the Lord led us there years ago to engage the people, to engage them with the gospel, and to see, as the Lord allows us, to plant new churches. And we're particularly doing it in homes because we want to see it grow and multiply through people's homes. Uh, buildings are very expensive to come by and hard to get. And so we're doing it through homes, and we just use our home as a center of ministry. In our living room, in our backyard, in our front yard is where where this happens. It's where our kids' night happens. It's where those things are. And it actually doesn't cost us anything because we already live there, <laughs> besides a lot of extra cleaning. So that's what the, the Lord is allowing us to do, and we are seeking to engage the people of Utah with the gospel. Uh, I was telling somebody the other day, I feel like in, we're in a stage right now where we're, we're trying to clear a field and kick a bunch of rocks. Right? And we're trying to throw some seed, and we've got to kick a bunch of rocks out the field and throw some seed. But I believe that one day, the Lord, in the next, I don't know, uh, years or decade, he's going to bring a movement to Utah of his spirit in and through people. And it's going to be, have been prepared by various people throughout decades, centuries in Utah. I want you to think about this thought as well. Utah was founded by LDS pioneers, and they've been in control and in power ever since the 1850s when Utah became a state. So the LDS faith is interwoven into every aspect of life, family, school, work, government. And guess who has the say in all of that? The, the church, their church, has the say in all of that. But I also want you to realize that many of those people, they're on the sixth generation. And if, if they are a sixth generation pioneer descendant, they are, they are excited about it. They're like, my great, great, great grandfather was one of the prophets in the church or one of the pioneers. They're excited about it. It's part of their heritage. So heritage, family, very big things. And they've lived there for six generations and they've never known the truth. And the question is, who's going to take it to them? 
do you believe that God wants to see those people saved? And if you believe it, what are you going to do about it? God wants to see all the nations give him glory, to give him praise, to give him honor. What are we going to do about it? That's a question that we had to wrestle with. We felt like the Lord particularly called us to go there as laborers into the harvest, into the harvest field. So anyway, I just wanted to, to share that for a little bit. That's what we're aiming to do. Use our home to engage people with the gospel and allow God, or God, Lord willing, to allow us to multiply that out into other homes and other areas across Utah as he does his work, and we're just part of that work. There obviously are other Christian churches that exist there, but not nearly enough. I think if you took this church and just transplanted it to Utah, this could be close to a mega church in Utah. Probably the average church size is like 25, 30, 40, something like that. So y'all are approaching mega church size. And so just, just keep that in mind as you think about what in the world is going on over there. But I just want to encourage you. That's what our work is trying to do. I'll go into detail tonight about what we're doing and how we're doing it and what we see the Lord doing um, in there. And I just did want to whet your appetite for a minute there. But um, I just want to encourage you in that. And I want you to encourage you that whether you're in Makokota or Utah, wherever the Lord has you, Let's exalt the name of Jesus. Let's lift up his name because he's the one who's actually redeemed us and bought us with his own blood. And he's actually rescued us. And he's brought us into his kingdom. And that's grace. But the vast majority of the world doesn't believe that. They don't believe it. They don't believe it. They don't follow it. They don't hold to it. And they teach something else. They teach that grace is something you can work towards. Something that you can actually earn or, or deserve. So I want to just challenge you with that, encourage you with that. And um, with one final thought I wanted to leave you with. Um, but it escaped my mind, so we'll have to wait till tonight to find out. Yeah. Then, um, I, yeah, I just wanted to thank, thank God for this opportunity today and, uh, and pray for a thing. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this opportunity to share today about who you are and what you're doing. And I pray, Lord, that uh, many could come tonight, if that be your will, about what you're doing in Utah and how we're just a small part of that. And it's our desire, Lord, to glorify your name, exalt you, and to lift up your name, the name of Jesus, the one who can save us from our sin. Bring us from death to life. We thank you for this. We thank you for him. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and we thank you for your work. Lord, not only here, but and around the world. Like even, even as we were singing earlier, when we don't see it, you're working. We can't feel it, but you're working. And you're a good God. And we just want to join you in that work as you lead us, Lord. And we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Ben. All right, let's stand up and sing again and worship. Um, this is our Lord.
I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord your presence your presence become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness lord so holy holy spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord oh yes lord we just ask that god um that we can be in your presence this morning um, Lord, I pray that you would just pour your Holy Spirit over Nathan as he gives the message this morning. Um, Lord, um, give him the words, um, give him the heart, give him the attitude to deliver what you want to convey to us, God, and help us to be able to have ears that can hear and hearts that will listen, Lord. Um, we just thank you so much uh, for your presence, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you guys can all have a seat. So we've been in the Gospel of Matthew, and we've been hearing Jesus talk about what it looks like to be part of his kingdom. He has come to bring uh, the light, as, as Ben shared with us powerfully just a minute ago, that he's come to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the light of his Father. And so the coming of Jesus into the world was to bring light into the darkness, to demonstrate to us powerfully that he is king. He is the king, and his kingdom is coming. And uh, he even taught us to pray, uh, let your will be done, let your kingdom come, uh, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are part of the answer to that prayer uh, that God's work continues in the world through his kingdom people, through uh, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so while we wait for his return to establish his, king, his eternal kingdom once and for all and to once and for all end sin and death and sickness, he shows us by the power of his coming and his son into the world that he is pushing back the darkness and his kingdom has come in. It's breaking in. And where Jesus uh, comes in, there is life where there was once only death. And where Jesus breaks in and brings life, um, sin is conquered and defeated. And the power of sin is broken in lives. And where Jesus comes, uh, sickness uh, has no power and authority. And disease is, is put off. And the realm of Satan is pushed back. And demons are cast out. And the enemy does not have the power and control to rule over these places where God's kingdom is breaking through. And so this is what God is doing in the world. And Jesus has come as the light of the world to bring the light of his kingdom and to transfer for us, for us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. 
But that wasn't just enough. It wasn't just that Jesus wanted to come and save uh, those he proclaimed the gospel to, but he was recruiting a team of disciples, of workers, so that he could multiply his ministry and send us out into the world to be part of what he was doing, to be part of his kingdom work, because he realized that the, the harvest was too great. Uh, the mission was too large for just Jesus to be on mission. And so we start today in Matthew chapter 9, and we're talking about the need for uh, the urgency, uh, urgency of being on mission for Jesus in this world. So let's go ahead and go to the first slide. Um, in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So as we kind of start in talking about what Jesus' mission and Jesus' ministry looked like, we're we're reminded that as we talk about Jesus calling us as his disciples into mission, to join him in his mission, that the call to follow Jesus isn't just the call to believe in him, isn't just the call to turn from sins to believe in Jesus and believe that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, that he is the very embodiment, the very uh, manifestation of the fullness of the Godhead uh, displayed in bodily form, wrapped in human flesh, God incarnate. It's not just enough to believe that Jesus is God in flesh, that he died on the cross for our sins, but to realize that the calling isn't just to believe in him, but actually to uh, uh, obey what he's commanded us to do and to engage with him in the mission and the work that he has given his that he gave his life to when he was on the earth. Um, so it's a call to obedience, but it's a call to be on mission for Jesus to do what he did in his time on the earth. It's not just a call to embrace and embody the kingdom values as Jesus' disciples to to live out his kingdom purposes, but it's also a call to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to others who are lost in darkness, just like we were. Um, So look at Jesus's ministry here as described by Matthew. What did did mission look like for Jesus? What What did he do when he lived and breathed and walked on the earth? Well, he went through all the towns and villages of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. This characterized his ministry. Uh, Think about this for a minute. The region of Galilee, where Jesus spent the bulk of his life in ministry, is only about 50 miles long, 25 to 35 miles wide. I don't know what the square mile, uh, square area of Jackson County, Iowa is, but it couldn't be that much smaller than that or that much bigger than that. 50 by 35, something like that. That sounds about about right. So it's a really pretty small area if you think about where Jesus spent the bulk of his life and ministry. And the first century Jewish historian Josephus tells us that in Galilee, where Jesus lived and ministered and and proclaimed the the gospel, there were at least three million people living in about 200 cities and villages, towns and villages. And so Jesus traveled through all of these towns and villages, all of these places, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So Jesus kind of had a threefold ministry, and it began with teaching in the synagogues. Uh, You remember that in Jesus' day, the synagogue was the center of the life of the community. It was the place where People would gather um, for social interaction, but also it was very important that it was the place where they were gathered, they met to be taught the word of God. And so all the people in the community would gather at the synagogue, and not just on the Sabbath day, there were several other times a week, uh, at least two other times during the week, plus every festival, every feast day, every holy day, and there were many of them throughout the life of the Jewish community. And every time they came together, the leader of the synagogue would read from Torah or the Pentateuch or the law. That's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then someone else would turn to a section and read from the prophets. Remember, they just had the Old Testament in Jesus' day. None of the New Testament had been written yet. So the law and the prophets, and that would encompass the whole of Old Testament scripture. And then someone would translate the Hebrew reading of scriptures into into Aramaic, which was the common language of the day. And then someone else would stand up and give an expository sermon explaining one or both of the passages that had been read to the people. Uh, The historian Philo wrote that the main feature of the synagogue in Jesus' day was the detailed reading and exposition of the scriptures. 
Um, so basically, the people came to hear the scriptures read and then to have it explained to them. That was the center of the community life. And that was so that they could know who God was, who Yahweh was. Remember the, the main feature, one of the main things repeated over and over again in the law is remember, 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 don't forget. Don't forget who God is. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget where God called you from. Don't forget your story and your history, where God has brought you. He, he, is the father, he is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of your ancestors. He's the God that brought you out of Egypt. He's the God that brought you safely through the wilderness. He's the God that brought you into the promised land. He's the God that conquered your enemies. So you've got a covenant with him. He's made a covenant with you that you are to walk in his ways, to obey him, to love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you're to teach these things diligently to your children. And so it was natural in the life of the community and it had been for 2,000 years since Abraham back in 2000 BC before Christ to read the scriptures regularly. And the people would gather to do this so that they did not forget who God was and who they were. And this was in uh, part and parcel with being uh, a growing up in a Jewish culture and community. And then there was also in the synagogues a custom known as the freedom of the synagogue. And the freedom of the synagogue allowed any visiting rabbi or a distinguished guest to be the one to get up and give the sermon. And so this was Jesus's pattern of ministry. He would go into a town in his home region of Galilee, in his county that he grew up in, and he would go into these villages and he would meet with them in their synagogues on the Sabbath or on any other holy day. And when it came time for the sermon as a distinguished teacher and rabbi and guest, he would stand up and interpret and explain the Old Testament passages that had been read. And usually they were talking about him. Over 300 messianic passages in the Old Testament scriptures alone. All of them were pointing to the promised son. Uh, the, the, the promised son of uh, Abraham. The promised uh, son of David. Uh, the righteous branch. The root out of the stump of Jesse. Uh, the, the promised Messiah that would come and reverse the curse and, and uh, re, uh, reestablish the kingdom of God on earth. And so he would tell them about the scriptures and how they related to his coming. Remember that very first time in Capernaum when he read in the synagogue and he stood up and said, read the passage from Isaiah that said, the spirit of God is anointed to proclaim good news, the good news of the gospel to the poor, to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind, heal the lame, uh, set at liberty the, the oppressed. He goes, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. What the prophet spoke about 700 years ago is now being fulfilled in me. I am the living, breathing fulfillment of the scriptures that were spoken about Messiah. And so he would declare this truth in the synagogues. Here's the second aspect of his ministry. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, the word proclaim here is caruso, which means to preach or to herald or to proclaim, to announce, to make a public proclamation. Uh, so he's talking about not just in the synagogue on Sabbath, but outside of the synagogue, God between the gatherings of the people on the Sabbath, on the streets, the highways, the hillsides, the marketplace, by the sea, from house to house, anywhere and everywhere that Jesus went, he was proclaiming that he had come to establish the kingdom of heaven, that he was the Messiah, that he was the son of uh, Abraham, that he was the son of David, heir to the throne of the kingdom, and, and to invite all who would believe in him to enter the kingdom and enjoy its blessings. So this is evangelism. Uh, this is evangelism. The teaching in the synagogue was edification. The people gathered there to be taught the word of God, and then he would go out into the community and proclaim the gospel, evangelism. And so this model that Jesus modeled is still a good, effective model for the church today. The church gathers to be taught the word of God, and scatters to proclaim the gospel. It's not just, hey, the goal isn't just to get everybody, uh, uh, you know, lost people, unbelievers in to, to hear the gospel, although they are welcome, and we, we invite any and all from the community. But this is primarily a gathering of believers to be reminded of who God is and who we are and what our calling is, and we're to be challenged up, instructed up, uh, encouraged, uh, edified, grow, grow into godliness, grow into holiness, grow into obedience, and then we're sent out on mission to be missionaries, to be ambassadors for Jesus, to be witnesses, to be representatives of Jesus uh, throughout the week, proclaiming the gospel everywhere we go. And so that's the model. The church gathers to be taught the word of God and scatters to proclaim the gospel. We're not primarily a come and see, but we're a go and tell. That's the great commitment. Go and tell the good news of Jesus to all who will listen. And then thirdly, Jesus had a healing ministry. Um, and what's this tell us about Jesus? Did he he cared about and ministered to people's physical needs. Remember, his healing ministry wasn't the goal, wasn't the end goal. 
Because remember what happened, what happened to everybody that Jesus healed, even those that he raised from the dead, what happened to them years later? They all died, okay? So his goal wasn't just to perpetuate eternal, just to give them uh, a, a, a continual experience of earthly life under the curse of sin. His ultimate goal was to, to give them eternal life that would never end, to give them eternal life, to save their souls from hell, not just to save their bodies from decay, uh, but to save their souls from hell. Um, and so uh, his healing ministry had an end. He met their physical needs um, because it was also a demonstration that he had compassion and uh, compassion on the brokenness of sin around him. Remember when he showed up at his friend Lazarus's funeral and he looked around at all the brokenness, all the weeping, the, the sickness and the death and just the, the horrific effects of the curse of sin on everybody? Uh, the hopelessness and despair without God and without hope in the world. That's what he saw. And it moved his heart. It broke his heart. He groaned in his spirit. He wept. Why? Because he was moved with compassion. And so uh, he cared about their physical lives and he cared about their, their souls ultimately because they were broken by sin. They were, they were dead in their trespasses and sins, as Ben said in Ephesians 2. They were groaning under the curse. They were dying in their sins. And without Jesus, God sending Jesus into the world, they had no hope, no hope. Their only goal was to live in a sin-cursed world, in a sin-cursed life, to groan under the curse of sin for a certain amount of years, and then to die and spend eternity separated from God forever in hell. That was, that was their lot in life. And what a bleak picture that is. No hope, no future without God and without hope. And so he, had, he was moved with compassion. This was not why he created us. He did not create us for isolation and separation from God. He created us for a glorifying relationship with God and, and, and right relationship with each other. And so the purpose of his healing ministry was to demonstrate that he was sent from God and that he was uh, the, the living, breathing manifestation of, of God's power. All the uh, power and um, attributes of God dwelled in him in bodily form, in physical body, by his power and his authority over every disease, he was truly Messiah. Wherever he went and did a miracle and pushed back the, the natural world when he calmed and stilled the storm, when he pushed back the supernatural world, world and, and uh, cast out demons and, and pushed them back, and whatever he healed and set back uh, disease and decay and death, he showed that he truly was Messiah, sent from God, who was the one who would reverse the curse. He was the answer to their prayers. He was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises that he had come to reverse the curse and ultimately to make all things new, to bring life where there had only been death up until this point. And another reason for Jesus' healing ministry was, again, to show the people that when the king had come, when the king had arrived and his kingdom came with him and it began to break in, the light began to dispel the darkness. There's no room for the rule of sin anymore. Up until this point, uh, Satan was the little G God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the one who ruled over this earth. And sin was the dominant rule, the, the horrible taskmaster. And everybody was enslaved to sin. And the wages of that sin was death. And so now Jesus came in, brought the light, brought light and life, transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of death through faith in him and his work on the cross and began to demonstrate that where the kingdom of God comes in, there's no room for the rule of sin anymore. Where the love and mercy and grace and compassion of the living God rules and reigns, people are set free from sin's enslaving power. That's, that's, that's what he came to demonstrate powerfully by his life and his ministry. And his healing ministry made that very clear. So Jesus, again, was the living, breathing manifestation of the love of God, the compassion of God. And he would reach out and touch unclean people, the woman with the issue of blood, the leper, um, Samaritan woman. I mean, he would touch people that no one else would look at, the blind man and the lame and the broken and the sick and the demon possessed that everybody avoided. Um, he, was, he demonstrated the love of God and the compassion of God. Uh, for these people and he touched them and brought healing to these broken people who were groaning under the curse of sin and its devastating effects and by taking on uh, a human body um, Jesus was demonstrating that God lived and walked among us as a man of sorrows who experienced our weaknesses felt our pain and he was moved with compassion why would he do this why would he care what what motivated Jesus we see what motivated him when he saw the crowds he was moved with compassion on them. He had compassion on them. First and foremost, uh, Jesus had compassion because, why? Because he was reflecting the heart of his father. 
The creator God is a compassionate, loving God. The Bible says that God is love. And, and Jesus and the Father are one. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me speak, you've heard the Father speak. If you've seen me express the, the compassion and love, that's an expression of my Father's heart for his creation. Jesus was the living, breathing manifestation of the heart and character of God for his creation. And it breaks God's heart that his, that his creation is groaning under the curse of sin. And that people, every moment of every day, are entering eternity separated from him forever. And so the Bible says, why did God send Jesus into the world? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is love, John tells us, one of Jesus' disciples. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. God is a God of love. He's a missionary God who sent his son into the world to redeem the people that he loves. And Jesus' life and ministry was a reflection of that compassion. So Jesus had this balanced ministry of teaching the word, proclaiming the gospel, caring for people's physical needs through his healing ministry, and it was an expression of the Father's love and compassion for us. What an incredible, beautiful picture. And there's another motivation here for Jesus' ministry. Why? Why? We see... Why was Jesus moved with compassion on the people? Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. The word harassed here uh, can mean worn out, exhausted, but it, it, in context, it probably means a little bit more like beaten up, battered, mangled, ripped, torn, actually skinned alive, if you use the sheep illustration. The people were devastated. Uh, and the word helpless means to be thrown down, lying prostrate, totally vulnerable, totally helpless. Can you imagine how Jesus viewed as he looked out on the people and says, these people are in desperate situation. They're in desperate need. Let me ask you this question. What is the job of a shepherd? If the people were harassed and helpless like, pe uh, like sheep without a shepherd, what, what's the job of the shepherd? What's the job of the shepherd? Protect and keep the sheep safe. What else? Well, there's some correction involved, yeah, to guide, to, to guide them into, into, into paths of righteousness. What else? Care for them? What do you got back there? Care for them <laughs> times two. That's, hey, sheep need a lot of care. You know, sheep are not the brightest animals, okay? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. We, we, we don't tend to... to to wander into good paths. We don't tend to wander into good pasture and besides still waters. We tend to wander into the briars and the brambles off the cliff into enemy territory where the wolves are. We tend to go our own way and it's not the way the shepherd wants us. Uh, did somebody else have something here? I didn't want to leave. Did you else have something down here? Okay. Uh, yeah, we hear, we hear the job of the, of the shepherd in, in Psalm 23, right? The good shepherd. What does he do? He, he leads us into green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. Job of the shepherd is to feed the sheep, to care for the sheep, to protect the sheep, right? He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, right? Um, and, and so Jesus looked out on the people that he was ministering to, and he saw that their shepherds had abandoned them. They neglected their responsibility. Uh, the leaders of the people, which was uh, the leaders of the synagogues, the, the scribes and Pharisees, even the political leaders had not only abandoned their responsibility to lead and protect and care for the sheep, but instead, even worse, even worse than that, they just hadn't, hadn't just abandoned their post, but they were instead abusing and preying upon and harassing these helpless sheep, bullying them, taking advantage of them. The so-called shepherds of the people hadn't just neglected and abandoned them. They were the ones that were beating up the sheep. They were the ones that were harming the sheep, that were hurting the sheep. They were throwing them down and skinning them alive. And Jesus says, what is going on? And he was moved with compassion. This was, this was the situation uh, in Ezekiel when the prophet Ezekiel described this same situation of the people of Israel in, in Ezekiel chapter 34. He says this, God told Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds. Prophesy against the shepherds, the leaders of Israel. Give them this message from the sovereign Lord. What sorrow awaits you, shepherds, who feed yourselves instead of feeding the flock? They were feeding themselves instead of feeding the flock. Or shouldn't shepherds feed their sheep, he asks? But instead, you drink their milk. You wear their wool. 
You butcher the best animals and you let your flocks starve. You haven't taken care of the weak. You haven't tended the sick. You haven't bound up the injured. You haven't gone looking for those who've wandered away and are lost. Instead, you've ruled them with harshness and cruelty. So my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd and they're easy prey for the wild animals. They've wandered through all the mountains and the hills across the face of the earth. No one has gone in search of them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, says the Lord, you who have abandoned my flock, you've left them to be scattered by every wild animal. And though you were, you were my shepherds, you didn't search for my sheep when they were lost. You took care of yourselves instead of the sheep and left them to starve. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I now consider these shepherds, you shepherds, my enemies. You are my enemies, and I will hold you responsible for what has happened to my flock. And I will take away your right to shepherd the flock, to feed the flock. And I will stop, uh, stop you from feeding yourselves at their expense. And I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and the sheep will no longer be your prey. Isn't that crazy? That the job of the shepherd is to protect from the wolves. And these shepherds were actually killing, butchering the sheep, and eating themselves. He says, I'm going to actually have to stop the shepherds from eating my flock. I'm not, I'm not having to stop the wolves. I'm having to stop the shepherds. How crazy is this? I'm going to hold you accountable, God says to the shepherds of his people. And who were the so-called shepherds of the people in Jesus' day? Pharisees, scribes, religious leaders, right? The religious people. Um, I, I'd say that this is true uh, in Ben and Amanda's situation. Those who step up in, in, in religious settings, in political settings, and say, um, God told us to say this, and God told us to lead you this way, but they're actually leading them astray and taking advantage of the sheep and leading them down uh, the path to destruction and not to the path to uh, life, which is the way of God. Uh, he says, look, um, I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to hold you accountable. And Jesus said in Matthew 23, I, I keep preaching Matthew 23. One day we're going to get there and you're going to be like, oh, we've heard this already. So <laughs> you can just keep moving on. I, I cannot wait to get to Matthew 23. But it's an indictment of the religious leaders, right? He says, Jesus said, you don't practice what you preach, you bunch of hypocrites. You crush people with unbearable religious demands and you never lift a finger to ease the burden. In fact, he says, you're actually, instead of leading people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, he says, you're actually slamming the kingdom of heaven, the door to the kingdom of heaven shut in their faces. What an indictment. He says, you're not going to go into the kingdom yourselves, and so you're doing everything you can to prevent others from entering there as well. You are leading people away from God, not to him. You're harming the sheep. What an indictment on these leaders, these supposed shepherds of the sheep. And Jesus saw them for who they were, and we see that today. And this is why Jesus was moved with compassion. God cares about what happens to people. You say, well, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? I, I, I don't see evidence for God's compassion. God loved us and sent his son. He provided a solution. He provided redemption. God weeps and his heart breaks for the brokenness of sin and for the slavery and the curse. And to see us, see his sheep, the people that he called into relationship with him, reject his rule and wander away into the darkness and go to their own destruction. It breaks his heart. He cares about what happens to people. He knows and he sees when they're being taken advantage of and bullied and harassed and oppressed and abused. When people become pawns to, to be used for their leader's advancement or for the leader's own benefit rather than to love and care for them in Jesus' stead. That's the job of the shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd and all other spiritual leaders are called under Jesus' spiritual leadership, the good shepherd, to be under shepherds. This is, uh, this is not my flock. You are not my sheep. You are God's sheep. And I'm called, I'm under an obligation, responsibility from God. My calling, calling is to shepherd you well because I'm going to have to give an account to the good shepherd for how I've fed and cared for and led and protected the sheep under my care. See, the sheep don't belong to the under shepherds. Um, the sheep are not to be used for the under shepherds advance, advancement or benefit. And so Jesus was moved with compassion by the neglect and abuse of his people by those who were claiming to serve him. What, what a horrific situation. And now Jesus calls his disciples to take action. That's part of his ministry. The mission and ministry of Jesus now becomes our ministry as his followers, as his disciples, that where we go, we are to be alleviating the suffering of 
people, to bind up the brokenhearted, to feed the hungry, to protect the vulnerable, to seek the lost, to shoot the wolves. And the ministry of Jesus' disciples is to be characterized by compassion for the spiritually oppressed and destitute and, and downtrodden and broken, rather than looking down our noses at them and going, Psh, and, and, and having condemnation and judgment for those who are, 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 are broken and, and enslaved by sin. We're to have compassion and move toward them. Think about the people in our community that we cast judgment on. People who are uh, enslaved by sin, addiction. Uh, people who are wandering far from God. I was seeing that, uh, that June is so-called Gay Pride Month. Um, and I was thinking about this. Um, I, I've, I've heard so many in the LBGTQ community express, thank you, <laughs> LGBTQ, that's a lot of, that's a lot of initials, uh, express that, that a lot of times they have maybe come out of a family of faith or they've had some kind of church experience and all they've received from the so-called followers of God is, is judgment, condemnation, rejection, looking down their noses, a critical, judgmental, unloving. And I, you've seen this probably on some uh, posts on social media. Um, by those who claim to be followers of Jesus, the, the animosity and the, the hatred and the vitriol to those who are far from God, that's the opposite of what Jesus did. He was moved with compassion. I think about the woman who was caught in adultery. Uh, she was caught in sexual sin. Well, how did Jesus respond to her? He says, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. He called sin, sin. We can call sin, sin. But there's got to be, the, the church ought to be the place, the one place on the face of the planet where people broken by sin and lost in the darkness can come and find light and hope and life and forgiveness and seek help and grace and find redemption and restoration rather than a stoning. Wow. Oh. Jesus was moved with compassion for those broken by sin. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd, as broken and hurting and needy. There's a need for the mission and ministry of Jesus in the world. And the church is dropping the ball. Yeah. So Jesus calls together his 12 and, and he commissions them and sends them out on mission to fill the vacuum of healthy spiritual leadership in his day. And we are to be doing the same in this day. This was... This, was, this passage is a foreshadowing of the role of the church in the work of the kingdom in our day. And so Jesus' mission was urgently needed because of the, the status of the flock was critical. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. People were lost and broken and enslaved by sin. And unless we go to them with the hope and the light and the redemption of Jesus, the power of God that can set them free from sin and deliver them out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, they have no hope. They're without God and without hope in the world. They're dead and headed for eternity, separated from God. Okay, then we're going to look in Jesus switched metaphors here in order to give us another perspective regarding the urgency of the mission. Let's look in, uh, uh, yeah, verse 37 and 38. Not only does mission require compassion, but mission requires prayer. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So Jesus uses the metaphor of a, of a vast crop of ripe grain in need of harvest to stress the urgency and, and the magnitude of the need. And in this metaphor, obviously, people are the crop. In the last metaphor, people were the sheep. In this metaphor, the people are the crop to be harvested into the kingdom and brought into the kingdom. Farmers, you understand this metaphor, don't you? Um, the harvest is incredibly valuable. The harvest is literally everything. Literally everything depends upon a successful productive harvest. Uh, the viability and solvency of the entire farm depends upon a good yield. Uh, you farmers are amazing because you're literally betting the farm every year and, and counting that God's going to give you a harvest. Because without a harvest, it can be devastating financially to the farmer. So everything depends on a successful productive harvest. Uh, so the harvest is the goal. It's the end game of farming. Uh, the hope of spring and planting is that one day in a, in a few months down the road, there's going to be a, a harvest um, that's going to feed the family and feed the world, literally. Um, but farmers, let me ask you this. Um, 
Okay, so, so, so the, the harvest is absolutely important, absolutely essential, absolutely valuable. Here's the second essential component of the harvest. The harvest has to be gathered in or harvested, obviously, okay, in order for it to um, provide the benefit to the end users, right? It has to be harvested. It has to be gathered in. So let me, let me ask this, farmers. What happens to a crop that isn't harvested when it's ready? What happens to a crop that isn't harvested when it's ready? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Okay, it can, it'll rot in the fields. It'll spoil. At some point, it's no longer a viable crop. It's no longer a viable harvest. Um, yeah, it, it, it will, you know, there's, there's a limited window, right? Um, the field needs to be harvested or, or the harvest will be lost. So Jesus told his disciples that the limiting factor here is not a lack of crops. There's, a, there's fields widened to harvest, he said. They're ripe. The harvest fields are ripe. Uh, there's not a lack of crops to be harvested, but there's a lack of willing and faithful workers. And so more are urgently needed. Um, and here is the, the other characteristic of the harvest. Uh, it's urgent. Timing is everything with the harvest. There's this limited window of time that closes quickly, and then the opportunity for harvesting is gone. The weather changes. It gets colder. Other things happen. Uh, the, uh, the stalks go down or the, the beans go down or... or Making or they, they rot in the fields, making it an unviable harvest. So Jesus used this metaphor with his disciples after talking to the Samaritan woman at the, woman, at, at the well in John chapter 4. Uh, and he said these harvest-type analogies. He says, listen, you've heard the saying, there's four months between planting and harvest. That was a saying back in the day in, in, in Israel. In, in, and he says, there's four months between planting and harvest. But he says, I say, uh, I say to you, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe. You don't have time to wait. There's no time to lose. You say, you know, the four months till harvest, like we can kick back and wait and, and we've got time before harvest comes. And he says, no, no, I say to you now, wake up, look around you. The field is already ripe for harvest. There's an urgent need. The time for harvest is now. We can't wait any longer. Uh, the harvesters, he said, are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. You see the analogy? Uh, people are being brought to eternal life. He says, this is what the harvest is, people. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. He says, you know the, play, you know the saying, one, one person plants and another person harvests? It's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant, and others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. We're so grateful for those who've come before us, who've uh, sown seeds and, and laid a foundation of faith. Um, uh, and that is kind of the work that Ben and Amanda are doing are in Utah. He's saying that he's kicking rocks and sowing seed because it's the first time many of them have ever heard the gospel. And it may be that they're sowing, and years from now, when they're long gone, others will reap a harvest because of their faithful work of sowing. But he says, we've got to go out. The time is now. There's an urgency in here. He says, I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others have already done the work, and now you get to gather the harvest in. And Jesus sees the vastness of the task, of the mission. And he calls his disciples to earnest prayer for more workers and more harvest. Pray earnestly that the Lord will send out workers into his harvest, he says. The mission field is far greater than the few workers uh, can possibly cover in order to reap the harvest in time. What do you say time? Well, we're in the last days. We're in the times between the comings of Jesus, his first coming and his second coming. He says, behold, I come quickly. I come soon. And he says, so you need to redeem the time because the days are evil. There's an urgency to this. We've got to work while it's yet day because the night is coming when no one can work. We're in this window of the harvest. We're in this window of grace where there's a great harvest of souls. And what a great time to be the church. What a great time to be the hands and feet of Jesus. What a great time to be um, missionaries and ambassadors for Jesus in this world. We're in the harvest season. Uh, and so we need to get to work. And the unreached people of the world need bo more bold proclaimers of the gospel, more disciple makers. See, Jesus was God in human form. And, and though he was God, he was just one man. He was limited by his humanity. And he could only go and personally proclaim the, the gospel. And that's also, by the way, remember we were talking while he said, hey, don't go and tell everybody what I did for you. When he did these miracles, don't go. Because what happened? The crowds would come and swarm him, and it, it hindered him from going to the next village. It kept him from going to the next village and teaching in that synagogue and proclaiming the gospel in that place and healing in that place. When they swarmed him here, he literally could not move. They would encapsulate him and enswarm him. And though he was trying to, 
teach there. It was chaos, and they were all trying to grasp at him and touch him and, and be healed by him. They were clamoring, hey, could you make us some of that bread? My, my uncle said you fed him on the mountain back, back a while ago. That would be awesome. Could you do that for me? Could you heal? The-? They were clamoring for their physical needs, and it was hindering him from, from meeting their, their greater spiritual needs. And so um, he was just one man, and he was limited. And he goes, like, I need more workers. Pray earnestly for more harvesters. We need to send more people out. He's going to send the 12 out here, and we're going to see in the weeks ahead that he's going to recruit more. He's going to send out 70, 70, 70 some out by twos. He's going to multiply his ministry. That is uh, because the, the mission was too vast for just him to fulfill in his short three years of earthly ministry. And so he calls and, and commissioned his disciples to proclaim the gospel and reap uh, this harvest of souls. And he's, he's, he's commissioning them to go out and make disciples who will make disciples, who will make disciples, who will make disciples. You get the idea, right? It wasn't just, we're not just called to make disciples and then the chain ends here. We're called to make disciples who, who see that the, the mission for them is to make disciples too. In other words, we're, to, we're called to not just to make disciples, but we're called to make disciple makers. Uh, the end game isn't just loving and following Jesus, but to be on mission for Jesus, helping other people to come to know and love and serve him too. Okay? And so, so that the gospel could go forward and be proclaimed to the ends of the earth and the, the great harvest that no one could count, uh, as Revelation says, from, from every nation and tribe and people of language would be brought into the kingdom. That's the goal. How can we ever complete the harvest? The job is so great. The mission field is so vast. Prayer is needed for more workers. We need more workers. We need to recruit a bigger team. Prayer moves our own hearts to the urgency of the, the harvest. And then God uses prayer to, to move others to come and accept the call for more workers and accept the call to head into the mission field and start reaping a harvest of souls. See, prayer helps Christians to bring their hearts into line with God's heart and for people who are lost and needy and broken and, and needing the gospel. The, the, for the billions around the world who've never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. So our obedience to Jesus' call to being on mission with him and for him begins with prayer. Jesus said, listen, there's a great harvest, but the workers are few. More are needed. So pray. Pray for more workers. It begins with prayer. Jesus commanded his disciples to pray that God would call and send out more workers uh, to proclaim the gospel and to reap this harvest of souls. Prayer, God hears and answers prayer. I read this week to Matt and Nicole, um, Psalm 120, right? Um, we cry out to God in our distress, and he answers us. He hears our prayers. And think about this. When, when, when Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he will send out more workers, do you think God's going to hear and answer that prayer? This is near and dear to the heart of God. God will always answer this prayer. But he asks us to pray it anyway. Pray that God will send, uh, that, that, that more workers um, will be called and will accept the call to go into the harvest fields and work. And so prayer moves God and brings the promise of response, uh, a prayer that God hears and answers. And so prayer, as we go to God and we get our hearts in line with God, it clarifies our vision and our calling. It brings us back into a line about what's important and what the priority should be, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all this other stuff that we're pursuing with our lives that's distracting us and derailing us from pursuing the harvest, from pursuing mission. He says, listen, I want you to get your hearts and minds in line with me. I want you to lay aside that stuff that's derailing and distracting you and be on mission for me. Have a laser focus for me. Listen, time is short. Your life is short. Even if God, uh, uh, even if Jesus does not return in our lifetime, what do I have? I mean, if God gives me a long life, what do I have? 30 more years? I don't know, 40 maybe? I don't know. That's short. I'm already over half of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm headed down the other side. And, uh, and so we gotta, we got to have this sense of urgency that the window is short. At least our, the calling for our window is short. Time is short. We need to be using our lives for that which matters for eternity, right? And so um, we need to be on mission in prayer clarifies our vision by bringing us into line with God's vision and it helps us as we pray with others and for others it helps to bring open up their vision for others to see what God sees as people without of sheep without a shepherd as people who are broken and enslaved by sin and it moves their heart to compassion to do something about it to to engage the problem not just to acknowledge that Jesus is the hope of the world but then to take the hope of the world to the people so that they can believe in him and receive that hope and forgiveness too and so this is, the, this is the mission. 
um, and it begins with prayer. Two great needs disciples are to hold up before God the Father in prayer. Two great needs that we as the church are to be holding up to God before prayer. First, for people lost in the darkness to recognize their desperate need for Jesus to save them. Listen, unless the Spirit of God draws them, unless the Spirit of God convicts them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, they're not going to come to know the God. Uh, the, the people uh, that Ben was describing earlier that have believed a lie, that are, that are literally uh, under a delusion of Satan. They've, they've been taken captive by false ideologies and, and not according to the truth of Christ, not according to the word of God. And so they're, they're held captive in bondage, enslaved by the lies of the enemy. And unless the spirit of God does a work in their heart and brings the light of God's truth to shine on their hearts and their minds, um, the Bible says if, if the gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are in darkness. And he says, um, and so we've got to pray that God will shine the light of the gospel on their hearts because the enemy is actually veiling their minds to the truth. And so we need to take the light of the gospel and pray that, that these people who are living in darkness would see the light of Jesus and see their desperate need for Jesus to save them. The second thing we need to be praying about is for Christians. Okay, we pray for unbelievers, lost people, to see the light of Jesus and come to it, to, to run to it instead of run from it. The second thing we need to pray is for Christians to be stirred up to obey Jesus' call to boldly proclaim the gospel to them. It is not just my job to be the, the, the sole gospel proclaimer in this community. It is all of our job. Every one of us have believed the truth of the gospel has shined us, and every one of us is a missionary. Every one of us has been called to be a gospel proclaimer, to share the hope that we have with those that don't know him. And so the, we need to be praying that Christians would be stirred up, uh, that a fire would be lit under all of us as Christians to to take Jesus' command and call to make disciples to boldly proclaim the gospel seriously and to do it. The mission to which we've been called will not happen apart from uh, spirit-empowered prayer. When was the last time you prayed for lost people to be saved? When was the last time you prayed for your brothers and sisters to have a fire lit under them to make the best use of the short time that we have on earth? Uh, and to live for that which matters for eternity, and to make the most of every opportunity we have to share the gospel, to share the good news with people who don't know it. And you may be th sitting there thinking, well, actually talking to people about Jesus, I thought prayer was a private matter, and talking to people about Jesus makes me uncomfortable. Um, that is the calling, right? Accepting the call to be a disciple of Jesus requires. We talked about the cost of discipleship just a couple weeks ago, and one of the costs of discipleship is the, the cost of... Um, our personal comfort, right? Uh, obeying Jesus, accepting the call, moving into mission in a bold way uh, is a call to leave behind our personal comfort zone and our personal comfort and our personal security and safety. Jesus is the ultimate example of this, of living a life of self-sacrifice for others. He laid his life down for the sheep. We look to Jesus He's the author and perfecter, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Listen, he was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. He was harassed and persecuted and hounded his entire earthly ministry. Do you think it was comfortable for him in his humanity? No. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Um, he's a sympathetic high priest because he knows the, our weaknesses. He knows the suffering that we experience in this life. He said, Hey, that's my experience too. Think about how uncomfortable your neighbors and friends and loved ones will be if they don't hear the good news of Jesus. How uncomfortable they will if they have to be if they spend eternity separated from God forever in hell. And that should move us to be a little uncomfortable for the sake of their eternal comfort, right? Um, Jesus calls us out of our comfort zones and sends us out into a world that is desperately needing the hope of Jesus. So the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, Jesus says. So pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he will send out workers in his harvest. See, prayer is a major key to effective mission. And so we need to be praying as a church for lost people and for Christians to, to obey Jesus and his call to ministry. What else does mission require? Let's look in the next slide here in verse, verse 1 of 10, and we're, gonna, we're about wrapping it up. Mission requires God's power, right? We can't do this in our own strength. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him. And he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. See, Jesus called his disciples in order to send them out on mission. 
and it was, a, it was an initial answer to the prayer he just prayed. He says, I'm telling you to pray for more workers, and now guess what? You guys are the more workers. Go. And he's calling them together, and he sends them out and gives them authority and power. It's By not staying together as a large group, Jesus multiplied his ministry, right? He maximized their ability to reach larger numbers of people. When he got swamped, his disciples were in the villages around, proclaiming the good news of, of the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus had already, previous to this story, we already saw that he called his 12 disciples. So this commissioning here that Jesus does appears to be kind of the culmination of several previous stages of training. They've been in the process of training. They've been walking with him perhaps for a year or more at this point. Um, he's been equipping them and training them, and they've been watching his example. And now he's going to send them out on a field practicum or a field trip and, and, and do some field training. Um, they had been watching how they'd been traveling and sitting under Jesus' life and ministry, hear, hearing his teaching, watching how he engaged in ministry and mission. And now he's sending them out to do what he was doing to multiply himself, to multiply his ministry of teaching and gospel proclamation and healing. And so Jesus is giving them experience. He's training him. He's preparing them to be the ones that will carry on his mission in the world after he's gone. He's training his successors. He's training his replacements, and that's what we need to be doing too. And that's why we take so seriously the equipping and training up of our children to know, love, and serve Jesus. They're going to be the next generation. Every generation of, of believers is responsible for that generation of souls. And this next generation that we're raising up to know, love, and serve God, they're going to be responsible once we're gone. They're going to be responsible to carry the torch, to carry the baton of discipleship and of mission for Jesus in this, in this dark world as long as Jesus tarries and doesn't, uh, as long as we're waiting for him to return. And so... Um, we've got to be training our successors and training our replacements as Jesus did. These 12 were actually became the original pillars of the original church, this new fledgling church after Jesus left. And this is why later Jesus would commission them not only to go and preach the gospel, but what he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples, right? Make disciples who would make disciples. Make disciple makers. He knew that they weren't going to be around too long either. Do you realize it was only about 30 years after Jesus's uh, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension up into heaven, that most of the disciples, most of these 12 were already dead. Just like 30 years, not very long. Three decades of ministry. Most of them were martyred for their faith by that time. Uh, John, the beloved disciple, got to stick around a little longer, but most of the rest of them were already dead, including Paul, who came even a little bit later. He was, mur he was martyred in the early AD 60s, okay? Mid to late, AD 60, 65, 67. So by that time, all these other guys were gone. And so it was literally, you know, 30, 30 plus years after Jesus left that these guys were gone too. So he says, look, you need to go out and make disciples who will be able to carry on the mission uh, and the work uh, of the kingdom long after I'm gone and long after you're gone. This is how the kingdom goes forward. This is how the harvest is harvested, is reaped. So Paul received this same disciple-making commission from Jesus later when he met him on the road to Damascus. And then Paul passed it on to his protege, Timothy. Remember what he said? The things that you've heard and seen in me and you've heard me teach, you now teach these truths to other faithful or trustworthy people who will also be able to qualify and, and will teach others also. That's the idea. We teach people who Jesus is, what he said, walk in obedience to his will and his way, and then they turn around and teach others also. And they teach the next generation and the next generation so that by the end, as the gospel goes forward and people are harvested and people come into the kingdom, the kingdom goes forward to the ends of the earth, right? And so the calling and commission of Jesus' disciples is not just to make converts, not just to fill seats in the buildings, not even just to make disciples, but to make disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. That's the only way that the gospel is going to reach the ends of the earth and the vast harvest of souls will be reaped before the window of grace is closed, before Christ returns. Time's up. It's enough. So the mission is enormous and the darkness in the world is great. And the enemy who opposes the mission and message of Jesus is powerful and organized and is motivated to oppose the gospel going forward and the work of God in the world. So what is needed? God's power. God's power is needed. This is not going to happen by the will of man. God's power is needed if Jesus' disciples are to accomplish the mission to which he called them. Listen, if you haven't figured this out yet, the mission and message of Jesus in the world, it's divisive, right? Not everybody goes, oh, Jesus, 
waiting for you to tell me. Some do. Praise God. It's always amazing when somebody goes, I've been waiting. I've never heard this. And I've been waiting for somebody to tell me. And you're like, thank you, Lord. But, but, but there's also that other reaction, right, that you get from some people. It's divisive. It brings rejection. There's opposition. There's persecution. Part of what probably been meant by kicking some stones, right? Um, it's hard. It's not easy. There's opposition. It was the same in Jesus' day, and it's no different in our day. Maybe even more so because the enemy realizes that his time is short and he's redoubling his efforts, right? Jesus told his disciples, this is going to happen. In John 15, he says, if the world hates you, just keep in mind that it hated me first. This is how it goes. If you're going to be on mission for me in the world, don't expect to be loved. You're going to be hated. See, if you belong to the world, it would love you as one of its own. But you don't belong to the world because I called you, chosen you out of the world, and that's why the world hates you. Uh, those of you that are clamoring to, to have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, it doesn't work like that. If you want to be loved by the world, he says, don't be the world of the things in the world. If you, anyone loves the world and the world loves them, the love of the Father's not in you. You can't have it both ways. Listen, we, he wants single-hearted devotion for him, not for the things of this world. He, the things of this world are not going to last. They're dying and they're decaying and they lead to destruction. So don't give your hearts away to them. Don't, don't give your affection. Set your affections on things above, not on things on this earth. It's just, so if the world loved you, I mean, if you were of the world, they, they would love you, but you're not of the world. I've called you out of it, and that's why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, Jesus said to his disciples, a servant isn't greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If you think you're going to get out of this thing alive, it's not going to happen. If you're serious about mission, it's going to be hard. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be persecution. They're going to persecute you too. If, if they obeyed my teaching, they will listen to you and respond to you. They'll obey yours too. Teach them what I commanded you. They'll treat you this way. Why? Not because they hate you or don't like you, but they'll treat you like this because of my name. Jesus said they're rejecting me and they're rejecting the message that I've sent you. For they don't know the one who sent me. They don't know me or the one who sent me. So shining the light of the gospel into the darkness of this world is going to bring opposition. Why? Jesus said because the people love darkness rather than light. They hate the light of God's truth because it exposes their sin. It exposes the lies they're believing. But the truth and light of the gospel pushes back the darkness and it requires the power and authority of God. We can't do this on our own. We can't do this without God. We can't do this without the spirit that we were inviting into our presence this morning. Let's be honest. We are weak. We are fearful. We are timid. Uh, it, it gives us fear and trembling to walk out this door and to be on mission for Jesus. It's scary, right? The task of mission seems overwhelming. We don't know where to start. We're afraid to start. We're afraid what other people will think if we ask them about Jesus. If we tell them about Jesus. So how does Jesus deal with the weakness and powerlessness of his disciples? He gives us power and authority. He gives us his power and authority. Remember what Jesus said in John 20 when, when Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection, he appeared to his disciples and he said, as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. As the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And just before he left, uh, he said this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Ju all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is with my power, the power of the Spirit. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, but I'm going to send my Spirit who will not only be with you, but he will be in you and he will give you all the power you need. He will even give you the words to say when you are, come up before men. And so don't be afraid. I'm going to give you the power you need to be on mission for me. And he, he gave us the Holy Spirit. So we have the power of God to accomplish the mission he's called us to do, right? So this is an encouraging thought. Those whom God calls into mission, and that's all of us who know him, will be given his power and his authority to accomplish the mission to which he's called us. Praise God for the indwelling Holy Spirit. And um, I tell you what, we're going to wrap it up there. Let's just look at the next slide here real quick. We're going to pick it up. In this slide, and these are the 12 disciples who we called. And we're going to pick this up next week, and we're going to begin to talk over the coming weeks uh, discussing the instruction of the disciples and what mission, what Jesus said mission was going to look like for them. But just know this, that these guys were weak, fallible human beings. Uh, they needed to grow in faith. They were weak in faith, right? They lacked commitment. Uh, they needed to grow in humility. They were arrogant and proud. They kept arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Um, uh, they needed to grow in knowledge and understanding. They, needed, they, they lacked power. Uh, they lacked humility. So Jesus, 
graciously trains, equips, empowers, and calls them and sends them out. By the way, this is the first time that these guys are ever called apostles. First and only time in the Gospel of Matthew these guys are called apostles. And apostles means sent ones. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you out into the world to be my emissaries, my ambassadors, my witnesses, uh, my representatives on the earth. And this is the calling, right? And so we're going to talk over the coming weeks. I want you to look at the next slide. Pull up the next slide real quick. This is Prairie Creek Church Mission and Vision. It should look a lot like what we've been talking about, right? If it doesn't, we're, we need to make some adjustments, right? But we're, we are called to glorify God, to exalt Jesus, as Ben said, by making disciples of Jesus Christ through gospel, community, and mission. And what does that look like? For us to go out, to boldly proclaim the gospel, inviting people into authentic community with Jesus and each other, and equipping them to continue the mission of Jesus. We're to be co- continuing to equip one another to be on mission for Jesus. So here's the question for you and I. How are you continuing the mission of Jesus? How are we as a church, how are you as an individual believer carrying out the mission of Jesus? Are you boldly proclaiming the gospel? I mean, if you truly believe that the gospel is true and you believe it and it saves you, why would you ever want to, if you believe that Jesus is the hope of the world, why would you ever want to keep that to yourself? Right? If it is the good news, if it is the hope of the world, it is the only way to God, then we better be sharing it because everybody is lost and headed to eternity in hell, right? So where do we start? Jesus commanded the few disciples who were standing with him when he ascended back up into heaven after his death and resurrection. He says, I want you to start right where you are. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Start in Jerusalem right where you are right now. And then I'm going to spread you out to Judea and then to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth right? Out into the larger region, their county, their neighboring counties, ultimately extending their witness ever outward in increasing circles of gospel witness and gospel power. This is the mission. This is the mission that Jesus embodied, and this is the mission to which you and I have been called. The question is, as Ben asked earlier, what are we going to do about it? What does obedience look like for you individually? We need to be praying that God will send out more laborers, more workers, into the harvest and we need to be diligent to be out harvesting proclaiming the gospel in this short window of grace that we have because uh, the harvest is ripe right now and we need to be reaping while it is still day because the night is coming and the window of opportunity will be closed our our opportunity to be on mission for jesus in this life will be done and then we'll give an account of how we've used that moment the opportunity that day of harvest for his kingdom purposes So, what do you say? Will we be on mission? Will we go out and boldly proclaim the gospel, inviting people into authentic community and and equipping and discipling and sending out missionaries for for the harvest? I hope so, because that's what we're called to be by Jesus, and that's what we're called to do. Let's be on mission for him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this incredible call by Jesus. Um, We're convicted by it, because truth be told, we get pretty comfortable. We get pretty complacent. We kind of like our little comfortable place in the world, the little piece of the American dream, the little piece of the pie that we're enjoying, and, and it's easy to be complacent and comfortable and, and begin to live for the here and now and begin to live for what makes us comfortable and what's safe and what's easy. But you haven't called us to be safe or easy. You've called us out of our comfort zones. You've called us out of our self-absorption, and you've called us to lay down our lives for others. You've called us into, into gospel proclamation. You've called us into mission for you, and that makes us uncomfortable. You've called us to be bold proclaimers and, and standing in the evil day and, and standing faithfully and proclaiming even when there's opposition. But thank you that you've promised us power, and we pray for that power. We pray for lost people, that you will help us to be faithful in shining the light of the good news of Jesus in this dark place, in this dark community for the glory of God. And then I pray that you would light a fire on us as believers to be, to be out on mission for you. And asking ourselves, what does mission look like for me, Jesus? I want to be obedient. I want to be faithful. I want to say yes to you. I don't want to say yes to uh, lesser dreams and give my hearts away to things that won't last for eternity. I want to live my life and invest my life for kingdom uh, purposes. I want to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And I want to live for you and I want to be on mission for you. I want to be a faithful, obedient disciple maker. So help us to be faithful in that and help us to ask and answer what obedience to your mission in our lives looks like. And then we're going to trust that you're going to do a, a continue this great harvest of souls here in Iowa and literally around the world for your kingdom purposes. We ask for that. We pray for that. We believe in that.
by the power and glory of the Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming and worshiping with us today. Love for you to come back this afternoon right here at 4 o'clock to hear a little bit more from Ben and Amanda about how God's pushing back the darkness in Utah and so and how they're on mission for him there. God bless you. Now go out to the mission field and what? Okay. Okay, you just doubled attendance. So there's food, people. Do you hear that? After we're done here, there's food. So attendance just doubled. They're like, oh, well, if you just said it that way, we'd have yeah, made plans. We're, we're changing our plans. So, yeah, uh, there's going to be time of fellowship here, time of hearing, uh, praying for Ben and Amanda, praying for our obedience in this, and then we're going to go out and hang out at Fifth Ward Park after and have some food and fun, okay? Uh, God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you later this afternoon. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the